This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about whether the U.S. government is about to default on its debts. What this would mean is the U.S. government stops making coupon payments or interest payments on its debt and fails to pay back all of the people and institutions that, have, that it has borrowed money from. There have been a lot of articles about this, especially driven by Treasury Secretary Yellen's warnings about a debt default and the problem with the debt ceiling. So there are two separate things here. The debt default is a question of whether the U.S. government is going to pay back its debts, just like you or I could default on our debts. Maybe we don't pay back our credit card or we don't make our mortgage payments. That would be a default if we stopped paying, the, paying off our debts. That's what a debt default is. When you have a sovereign default, that would mean that a whole country uh, fails to pay back its debts or misses a coupon payment. The debt ceiling is something a little bit different. This is a technical thing, how much money Congress allows the U.S. Treasury to borrow. And the way the U.S. Treasury borrows is by selling U.S. government bonds that are called Treasury. So these two things are linked. Basically, this happens every couple of years. If you've lived long enough, you know that under every single president, under every politician, we get a debt ceiling crisis. And the way it works is this. A bunch of red and blue idiots, Democrats, Republicans, spend too much money over decades and decades and decades. And then uh, they never collect enough taxes to pay for this. So the government has to borrow a lot of money. And then these same politicians who, who are behind all of this government spending act completely shocked and self-righteous. And they run around accusing each other of failing to raise the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling is really just a piece of paper that says how much debt the U.S. Can Treasury can sell to finance all of the spending. So debt ceiling crises are political theater. They don't mean anything in the scheme of things. And I'm going to show you why in a minute. In the meantime, if you've been enjoying this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button and maybe share the video with a few friends. So the first debt ceiling crisis happened in 1953. We had one in the late 90s under Clinton. We had one in 2011. And you'll see lots of articles here about how one president handled the debt ceiling crisis better than another. This is mostly nonsense. But what's hap happening now is there are pressures in the market. This has been causing, that all of this talk has been causing treasury yields to move up, which is another way of saying U.S. government bonds are selling off. This is uh, perhaps driven in part by people being worried that maybe the government's not going to pay back its debts. If you own treasuries and they miss a coupon payment or don't pay you back your principal, things could get very ugly. Now, what happens when U.S. treasuries sell off? That means interest rates are moving up. When interest rates move up, uh, everything goes down. Bond prices, not just government got bonds, but corporate bonds go down. Uh, stocks go down. Housing prices go down, though there's not really a, a daily mark to market on housing prices. And what happens when you have lower asset prices? Basically, when interest rates rise, the discount rate is rising, and so asset prices fall across the board. And think of what happens in your own household. If your stock portfolio is down, if your housing price is down, you begin to feel a little bit poorer, you probably buy less stuff, and also you pay less in taxes simply because if you're down on your house or you're down on your stocks and you sell them, there's no capital gains tax that is due. So when asset prices fall, we have consumer spending fall, and we also have tax revenues go down because so much of tax revenues are driven by capital gains on stocks and houses these days, especially in the U.S. When you have less consumer spending, this hurts the overall economy. The U.S. Con economy is really kind of a form of consumer capitalism. It's very, very driven by the consumer. And so you get GDP, which is a measurement of the size of the economy. That shrinks when you have less consumer spending. Lower tax revenues means that the government actually needs to borrow even more money to make up for the shortfall because they never cut their spending. But tax revenues rise and fall with the economic cycle. If tax revenues are down, the government needs to issue even more bonds, issue even more debt, which puts it into a more precarious position. Obviously, the more debt you have, the more fragile you are. What this means is that both of these actions, both of these forces actually tend to increase the debt to GDP ratio. And uh, basically, uh, the government debt goes up and GDP goes down from less uh, consumer spending. Government debt goes up from more issuance of debt because tax revenues are down. This has been a problem, and we're now at the really the end of the 
long-term debt cycle, debt to GDP peaked out at around 135% last year. It's, it's come down about 10 percentage points since then, but it's still extremely high. We cannot do the Paul Volcker playbook of the late 70s, early 80s, where he massively raised interest rates, because when he did that, debt to GDP levels were much, much lower. They were around 30%. Right now, they're about 100 points higher than that. And you simply cannot uh, raise interest rates with, when, when the debt to GDP ratio is this high or asset prices fall and you get in sort of a, a debt default spiral where tax revenues fall and you have some of the dynamics we've been talking about and you actually will end up increasing the debt to GDP ratio. GDP, as I said, is a measurement of the size of the economy. And the reason we look at debt to GDP is it measures the relative ability of an economy to service a certain level of debt. So if you have a tiny economy and a huge mountain of debt, that doesn't work. And so by making a ratio of both of these, we can sort of see where we are in the historical cycle. And people who say that interest rates need to rise massively are completely unaware of debt to GDP levels and how levered the economy is, how financialized and levered it is. The reason we look at debt to GDP is sort of a way of normalizing things so we can compare the economy in the 1970s and 80s and 90s to the economy today. It's a little bit like, uh, this isn't an exact analogy, but it's, the, it's like thinking about a household that has $200,000 of credit card debt or student loan debt and then household income of $50,000. By measuring debt to productive capability, it gives you a good idea of how levered you are. This is sort of an income, a debt to income ratio, so it's not exact. Uh, but it is another way of, of measuring things. The basic problem here, if we look at the U.S. debt clock, we've referred to this many times, uh, U.S. tax revenue is about $3.8 trillion. Over the last 12 months, U.S. Uh, government spending at the federal level, this isn't even at the state level, about $7 trillion. And so we have what's called a federal budget deficit of about $3.1, $3.2 trillion. This is a deficit that needs to be made up. It's basically the, the difference between what's coming in and what's being spent. And if you're a household and you're spending more than you were making, that means you need to borrow money, you need to go into debt, probably using a credit card or getting a mortgage. Uh, and the same thing happens with the U.S. government. They need to raise, basically they need to raise at least $3.2 trillion in new government debt every year just to plug this deficit and to create enough money so that the government can continue to spend at these crazy, uh, at these crazy rates. So that's the basic, uh, the basic situation, the basic financial situation for the U.S. federal government. And we haven't even spoken about the huge off-budget, uh, off-balance sheet liabilities like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, etc. None of these can be cut. You can't stop spending on defense. If you're a, uh, a global sovereign, you also can't, uh, you can't default or that will cause all these problems. So when people talk about, is the US government going to default on its debt? I have a couple answers for that. The US will never, ever, ever default on its debt. It will never miss a coupon payment. It will never fail to pay back principal. This is all, this is all political theater. And people like Yellen, they're very cynical in the way that they do this, and as are all of our politicians. So there are really two kinds of default, though. When I say the U.S. government will never, ever, ever, ever default on its debt, what I'm talking about is a hard default. This is, as we said, where the U.S. government, the federal government, might miss an interest payment on its debt or fail to pay back principal. This will, this will never happen, this kind of hard default. And it doesn't have to happen. Uh, simply because the U.S. government controls the money printers. They can always print up new money to pay off their debt. But this is where we, we've actually been in a state of soft default for probably a, at least a decade and maybe more in the U.S. So in that sense, there's sort of a false dichotomy here. Is the U.S. going to default on its debt? Well, in regular hard default terms, never. But we've already defaulted on our debt many years ago. You could say we defaulted on our debt in 1971, when Nixon closed the gold window, we'd printed up too much paper, wasn't backed by gold. That was a soft default. And that soft default has continued. It's only gotten worse really since 2009 when the Fed started printing a lot of money to buy assets, what's called quantitative easing. So we have been in default. You could say we've been in default for 50 years since the end of the gold standard. But we've certainly been in default for a very long time where the, US, uh, where the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, has been printing up money to buy U.S. government debt. So a soft default 
is what we're in, what we will continue to be in, and this is where the U.S. government pays back its creditors with U.S. dollars that are worth less. So, and this, as we said, this has been happening for many years. There's no reason ever to have a hard default because the U.S. Treasury can always issue new debt to pay off old debt. This is what happens. The debt never gets paid off. It just gets rolled and it gets increased in the process. This is a little bit like a mortgage refi where you may pay off your old, your old mortgage loan by taking out a new mortgage loan, usually at a lower interest rate. So this is very common to roll debt or to issue new debt to pay off old debt. It's much easier when you're a sovereign and you're the world reserve currency, which the U.S. dollar still is. Now, you may say, well, the U.S. Treasury can try to issue new debt to pay off its old debts uh, and also to pay uh, coupon payments for current debt holders or to pay off principal and mature debt. It can always issue this new debt, but what if the market refuses to buy it? Well, this has already been true for many years. It's really been true since, call it 2015, when other countries, when other central banks on the margins stopped buying U.S. debt. And this is why the Fed has had to step in. The Federal Reserve, which is a U.S. central bank, they've been printing up fresh dollars to buy this new debt from the Treasury. And this is, this is why we're never going to have a hard default. What we're seeing is political theater. Meanwhile, it's meant to distract you from the fact that this soft default is continuing. There is a price to pay. Uh, the nice thing about the Fed printing up more U.S. dollars is that it props up the stock market, it props up the bond market, it allows the, the federal government to spend money on whatever it wants and whatever amounts. But when these new dollars are printed up, it dilutes the money supply. It increases the money supply and it makes the value of each dollar worth less, which is another way of saying uh, stocks go up, real estate goes up. It's not that these assets are going up in price, it's just that the fiat currency that they're denominated in is falling. And so whether your house is worth $100,000 or a million dollars doesn't really make a difference to you once you already own it. Obviously, it makes a big difference to the next generation that has to enter the uh, the housing market. But you get no additional utility whether your house is worth $100,000 or a million dollars. If your house goes up 10x like that, it means all the other houses have gone up as well. And so it's, you're, you're not any wealthier, really. And this is one of the, the illusions of fiat currencies. So the way out is the soft default. The U.S. will not default on its debt. There's not going to be a hard default. We may get a continuation of the stock market sell-off and all the cryptocurrencies are selling off. All risk assets are moving down in tandem. But what this, what this does is it, it will reach a point where the Fed calls uncle, where Congress gets together and raises the debt ceiling. And then we'll go back to the highs in stocks. We'll go back to the highs in Bitcoin, etc. And there's no other way out. A U.S. a hard default would be catastrophic and would cause uh, would probably cause war and famine. There's no reason to do that. It's much it's much sneakier and easier just to print up fresh dollars and to pay off our debts with that to allow the the Fed to monetize U.S. government spending. This is a, a great tweet from uh, Dennis Porter. Once you realize fiat is going to zero against Bitcoin, you'll understand why this chart is an in inevitability. This is, uh, we can see we're right here, somewhere in the 40,000s on the price of Bitcoin. Up here, if you can't read it, this is $44 million per Bitcoin. We're still very, very early. Some of this, uh, when people see a chart like this, they always say, well, if Bitcoin's $44 million per, uh, per Bitcoin, this is not as great as you think because maybe a carton of eggs or a quart of milk will cost uh, $10,000 or $100,000 at that point. This is true in part, but it doesn't take into account the increased adoption. So we can have Bitcoin going up a lot, even without uh, having to worry about the fiat currency being debased. There's sort of two pieces there. There's the debasement of fiat, and there's also everyone rushing into Bitcoin as a reserve asset, as a safe haven, and uh, as a very useful uh, monetary tech Technology. So this is what's happening. This is one reason I have so much confidence in Bitcoin. It's much, much safer, in my opinion, to own Bitcoin rather to own rather than to own any sort of fiat. There's volatility. We have this correlation between stocks and Bitcoin that will not last forever. There is there are short term correlations when stocks crash, Bitcoin crashes. But look where we're crashing from. We're crashing from forty seven thousand down to forty two thousand or wherever we are now. A year ago, we were trading around 10,000 or so. And when stocks crashed a year ago, 
uh, for a couple of days, Bitcoin went down as well, but it's always crashing. Bitcoin's always crashing from a much higher base. And so you can have short-term correlation and yet you can still have long-term growth in the price of Bitcoin. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.